the last lecture, we discussed the motion of charged particles in electric and magnetic fields. We found that high energy charged particles coming from outer space are trapped by the earth's field and they form two belts known as Van Allen radiation belts. The important thing is that these particles are trapped and they do not reach the earth's surface and do not therefore harm life on the earth. I said that we shall start with magnetism today, but I think magnetism will take in the next lecture. In this lecture, we will take a topic uh, which we have still to do that is magnetic force on currents. We have already seen that an electric charge moving in a magnetic field experiences a force called Lorentz force. That force is given by F equal to Q V cross B as you know already. The emphasis is on moving charge because if the charge is static then the magnetic field has no force on it. Since the magnetic force on the charge particle is perpendicular to both V and B, it does not change the magnitude of V. It changes only its direction. That is, if the particle was going in this direction, then the magnetic field makes it move around the lines of force. It does not change the magnitude of V. It changes only its direction. This means that the kinetic energy of the particle is not changed, but its momentum does change. Also, since the force is perpendicular to the particle's velocity, no work is done. The magnitude of the force we have seen many times is Q V B sin theta, where theta is the angle between V and B. If the particle is moving along the field, then sin theta is 0 and therefore, there is no force experienced by the particle. That means, if a particle goes in a certain direction undeflected, it does not mean that magnetic field is there. The magnetic field may be there, but it is parallel to the direction of motion of the particle and therefore, does not affect it. If the current is uniform flowing through a wire of length L, then the force on it is F equal to I L cross B. You look at this D F is equal to I D L cross B. If I is constant throughout the length of the wire, then it becomes I L. So, the force becomes I L cross B that is if the current is uniform. And what does it do? You see L cross the B. So, if this is the length going up and B is magnetic field uh, going in, then you can work out by our old friend who is our old friend? The right hand screw rule. So, you can work out that if the length is up, the magnetic field is going in, then the force is in this direction. And this is also uh, given by another mnemonic called left hand rule of Fleming's. In this case, you extend to find the direction of motion of the or the direction of force on the current you extend the left hand fingers in this way. This finger represents the current, this represents the magnetic field. That means, if the current is in this direction, if the magnetic field is in this direction, then the force on the current is in this direction. That the, the current would move, if the movable conductor, then it will move in this direction. This is the Fleming's left hand rule, but my advice to you would be do not worry about the Fleming's left hand and right hand rules. What you worry about or what you learn is the right hand screw rule. If you right hand screw rule, if you remember this rule, then you can always find the cross product L cross B by using the right hand screw rule and you will never make a mistake. Now, suppose we have two long straight currents A and B and they are in the same direction, they are parallel to each other and the distance between them is d. The magnitude of the magnetic field due to current A at distance d from it which we found last time is B A. The field at B due to A is B A mu 0 I A by 2 pi d. This formula we derived in the last lecture or 
may be a lecture earlier. This field will exert a force. Now, there is a field, there is a current, therefore, there must be a force on the on the conductor. This force is I B L B A. L is the length of the wire and uh, I B is the current in this, B A is the magnetic field on this in this direction and therefore, you can work out the force. The force is mu 0 I A I B L by 2 pi d if I substitute the value of B A. And you can see this is symmetric whether I start with A or we start with B, the force on the two will be the force that these two feel the mutual force is mu 0 I A I B L by 2 pi d. And if I calculate the force per unit length, it is F A by L which is mu 0 I A I B by 2 pi d. So, that is the force between two wires and you can see that this force on B is in this direction, on A it is in this direction that means, the two are mutually attracting each other. So, two parallel currents uh, attract each other and if one of them is negative then say anti parallel currents one going like this the other going like this then there is repulsion between them. And this formula allows also to define an ampere. So, suppose one ampere current is going through these and the distance between them is 1 meter then we can find the force and that force would define the unit current called ampere. So, we find that the force per unit length would be mu 0 by 2 pi equal to 2 10 to the power minus 7 Newton per meter. So, an ampere is defined as that current which when flowing through two infinitely long parallel wires placed at a distance of 1 meter from each other would produce a force per meter between them equal to 2 10 to the power minus 7 Newton per meter. That is a formal definition of an ampere. Let us take an example. A long wire carries a current I. So, there is a current I. A charge Q is moving in a direction parallel to the wire with velocity V. So, we have a particle moving with velocity V. Find the magnitude of the force on the charge. Simple. Remember that a moving charge is equivalent to a current and these currents are parallel therefore, there will be the attraction. You can find what the attraction would be using the formula, but the basic thing is that this is a current in this direction, current in this direction distance d is given. So, I can always find out the force between them and this force will be at of attraction. This particle would be attracted by the current. In the above problem, what should be the direction of motion of the charge particle, so that the force on it opposes gravity. That means, what I require now is that I want the force to be in this direction, so that the gravity which is in this direction is opposed. So, obviously, we must be from right to left instead of from left to right, it must be from right to left, so that the two currents are now in the opposite direction, they are anti parallel, therefore, there will be repulsion. So, the force on this particle would be upwards. I can balance this by the weight of the particle and I can get the necessary velocity. So, that is what I have done. It is simple, you can do it. Now, one of the instruments that you must have used in the laboratory very often is a galvanometer, moving coil galvanometer. So, we want to now discuss the structure of a moving coil galvanometer. What would be the uh, principle? We will suspend a coil in a magnetic field. There will be force because the coil will carry current. In this current here is in this direction, here it is in this direction. So, there will be forces, they will constitute a couple and this couple would tend to rotate the coil. This will be opposed by the suspension. When the two balance, you get the uh, relation between the current and the deflection. That is the principle broadly. So, I will explain here. We have a coil here. This coil, suppose it is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Then what happens? You can work out. Now, you know the right hand screw rule. So, you can work out that if this is the direction of the current, then the force due to the magnetic field in this direction would be outwards. 
and on this side it will be in the opposite direction. So, we have two equal and opposite forces and as you know they form a couple. The arm of the couple is equal to the distance between these two forces. So, we have a couple, we, the arm of the couple is equal to the width of this coil which is B and the force is I L B. The couple would be therefore, or the torque therefore, would be I L B times the, the arm of the couple that is the distance between the two forces and therefore, the torque is I A B where A is now the area of the coil which is L into B. So, if there are n turns of the coil then the torque is N I A B and this torque tends to rotate the coil and the suspension opposes this motion and therefore, after some deflection the two come into a balance there is equilibrium and at equilibrium if C is the couple per unit radian of the suspension then C theta is equal to N I A B and from this I get I equal to N A B by C into theta. So, I turns out to be proportional to theta provided A remains constant. We will see how we can make A constant and why if A is not constant then this um, I is not proportional to theta. You see I have shown you here 5 positions of the coil. Here the coil is parallel to the magnetic field, the plane of the coil is parallel to the magnetic field and then the two forces are in the same line. So, the couple is 0, torque is 0. Here when the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the two forces are equal and opposite and the distance between them is the width of the coil. So, we have the maximum torque, here the torque is again 0, here again maximum, here again 0. So, the torque changes and therefore, we cannot say that I is proportional to theta because A is not remaining constant. How do we make A constant? We must devise a way in which the coil has the same area perpendicular to the magnetic field all the time. How do we do that? We embed a core in the coil. This core is of iron or some material which has properties of iron. These are ferromagnetic materials and they attract the lines of force or the magnetic field lines. So, they attract the magnetic field lines, they concentrate in the core and therefore, the coil is always, the plane of the coil is always perpendicular to the magnetic field and therefore, the torque is constant and therefore, if the torque is constant then this formula I equal to N A B by C into theta gives us I proportional to theta. So, the deflection of the coil is a measure of the current going through the coil and this arrangement of measuring current or uh, estimating current is called a moving coil galvanometer. A galvanometer is suitable only for detecting currents that is why it is used in experiments with meter bridges and potentiometers where the current is only to be detected and not measured. You must have done some of these experiments and therefore, you would know that there we just find out the point where there is no current and we just detect current we do not measure it, we do not need to measure in those experiments and therefore, we use this moving coil galvanometer. If we want to measure current then we need an instrument which has a very low resistance so that the potential drop across it is very small compared with the source voltage. Let me explain. Suppose source voltage is V and if this galvanometer has sufficient resistance then there will be a potential difference across it and that means the current through the circuit will be affected, but we want to measure the current. So, we cannot disturb the quantity to be measured. There is a general principle of physics. So, what do we do? So, we devise an instrument so that it has very small resistance and therefore, the potential drop across it is much much smaller than the source potential and this arrangement is called an ammeter. An ammeter is a instrument which measures current and how do we get the 
small resistance, we use a shunt. Here I showed the arrangement. Galvanometer has certain resistance. Then this shunt, a very uh, small value shunt, is put in parallel to the galvanometer, and this reduces the resistance of the galvanometer suitably so that we can convert this into an ammeter. Similarly, we we can convert galvanometer into a voltmeter. What is what is the purpose of a voltmeter? What is the job of a voltmeter? Voltmeter must measure the potential difference in the circuit. And if it is to measure potential difference, then it should not disturb the potential difference. That means there should not be any potential difference across its, itself. That means it must have a very high resistance so that no current goes through it or very little current goes through it. So, we use a very high resistance in series with the galvanometer and this instrument is called a voltmeter. So, that over the voltmeter itself there is very small potential drop. So, that the potential drop which we were supposed to measure is not disturbed. Let us take an example to understand what is happening. A galvanometer has a resistance of 19 ohms. It gives a full scale deflection for a current of 0.5 amperes. If it is to read a maximum of 10 amperes, what should be the resistance of the shunt? So, we have a galvanometer resistance 19 ohm. We want to convert this into an ammeter so that the ammeter can read 10 amperes of current. The full scale current in the galvanometer is 0.5 amperes. So, it is obvious that 9.5 amperes should go through the shunt. And since they are parallel, the potential difference across the, these two must be equal. So, 19 into 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is the full scale current in the galvanometer. So, 19 into 0 0.5 is equal to the value of the shunt S into 9.5 amperes. Because out of 10, 0 0.5 can go through this, 9.5 must go through this. And this gives S equal to 1 ohm. So, the shunt value is 1 ohm. Suppose the galvanometer of the last example is to be converted into a voltmeter with a range of 100 volts. What must be the value of the resistance to be attached in series? You see, the fall of potential across the galvanometer is 19 ohms into 0.5 amperes, which is 9.5 volts. So, up to 9.5 volts, it goes through the galvanometer. The rest 90.5 volts must go through this resistance, must fall across this resistance. So, if the current is current remains 0 0.5 because that is the current going through the galvanometer. So, if the current is 0 0.5, if the potential drop is 90.5 volt, then the resistance must obviously be 90.5 by 0.5, which is 181 ohms. So, if you apply simple logic, you can decipher such problems of converting galvanometers into ammeters and voltmeters. In the last lecture, we found this quantity Q B by M, which is the um, cyclotron uh, angular frequency. And its dimension must be T to power minus 1 is a frequency, therefore, it must be 1 by T. So, how do we show that Q B by M has dimensions T to the power minus 1? The best way to find the dimensions of Q B is to remember that F is Q V B. So, Q B is simply F by V. And Q B is F by V and there is M. So, it is F by M V. So, we can find the dimensions force by mass into velocity. Force is M L T minus 2. Mass is M. Velocity is L T minus 1. So, from these two you get T minus 1. So, it is easy to show that Q B by M the cyclotron angular frequency has the dimensions T minus 1. We have seen that a current loop exerts magnetic field at its center. Last time we saw that if we have a loop of current, then there is a magnetic field which goes through the center of the loop. That means, I told you that loop acts like a magnetic bar or bar magnet. And therefore, it has a momentum and dipole moment of the loop is given by I times A, where A is the area of the loop that is L into B is the area of the loop. 
and I is the current going through this. So, if I have a loop with area A and current I, then it acts like a dipole whose dipole moment is I times A. Now, what happens if I if I place such a loop in a magnetic field making an angle theta, then what happens? The magnitude of the moment of magnetic field parallel to the plane of the loop is B sin theta. And so, the force acting on the current I in the arm of length L is I L B sin theta and therefore, the torque is I L B sin theta into B. The torque is the these two equal and opposite forces multiplied by the distance between them which is B. So, L into B is area. So, it becomes I A B sin theta and I A remember is the magnetic moment. We just magnetic dipole moment of the loop. So, therefore, the torque on the loop placed in a magnetic field at an angle theta is I A B sin theta or M B sin theta and in vector notation this torque becomes m cross b. Remember that an electric dipole in an electric field experiences a torque which tends to rotate it that is equal to p the electric dipole moment of the dipole into must be e. So, the, the torque on an electric dipole in an electric field is the is p crossed e p is the dipole moment of the uh, dipole and e is the electric field so what have we learned in this lecture we have learned that if there is current and there is a magnetic field then the two interact and there is a force on the current which if the if the conductor is movable will move the conductor and the force is of course, I cross B into the length of the conductor and you can always um, find the direction in which the force will act or if you prefer which I do not if you prefer you can use the left hand rule of, of uh, uh, Fleming's. This is the current, this is the magnetic field and this is the direction of force acting on the conductor and if we have a uh, if we have a loop in a magnetic field then this loop tends to move and from the uh, and the suspension of course opposes this and the equilibrium is achieved at a certain deflection this deflection is a measure of the current going through the gal instrument this instrument is called galvanometer which can which we can convert into ammeter for measuring currents or voltmeter for measuring voltages. In the next lecture, now we shall take magnetism. Mm -hmm.